all participant please prepare your own uh, cup uh, snack corner <laughs> don't don't forget to get your drink your snack pak budi <laughs> pak budi debi wedesi <laughs> yeah do do you do the participants would they like to take a break at some point in the middle it's up to you Yeah, uh, uh, Mas Wendy, uh, if the participant need to uh, take a break for a while, just uh, inform to Pak Andrew ya. Uh -uh. Oke, okay, oke. Okay. Siap, Bu. Oh, still many others, only 35, I see. <laughs> Mas Epi kurang banyak ya, Mas Epi? Iya, Bu, uh, masih, kayaknya masih mengerjakan... Ah. Di Jadi saya lagi memasukkan manual juga Bu, masuk-masukkan manual ke panelis. Kemarin saya minta teman-teman itu masuknya via Zoom-nya itu login di email. Cuma kayaknya ada beberapa teman-teman yang nggak login dulu, jadi masih masuk di attendees. Saya bisa Technology call skill need very needed uh, in this time. Yeah, uh, when we use uh, when we use the technology of uh, like online training, sometimes if we don't get very familiar, so we have to uh, need time to adjust. So please be, be patient to waiting for. Oh, us. of course. The website worked very well, though. I was able to put in the quiz questions. It was uh, it worked very well. I thought. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Busri Anda, yani already here also. Busri. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Still, how many another person? Thirty and twenty. Ah. Masih berapa, Cepi? Sudah 52 ya, harusnya 65. Peserta 65, Bu. Jadi ini kurang masih banyak ya. Hah? Yang peserta 21 ini, Bu. Baru ya. Termasuk kita. Oh. Tapi mungkin ada Cuma yang nggak login pakai Zoom, jadi masuknya di attendance. Ya, Pindah-pindahin, bisa. <tuh> Pak Andrew, well, waiting for other participant. Could I uh, ask something? <laughs> How about uh, work from home in uh, Washington? Still happen or already all the FO now? <laughs> Everyone at uh, IMF is working from home. Ah, okay. All? Still. All stuff? Okay. Everyone. Oh. Everyone. So uh, some people who are from other countries went back to their home country. Oh really? Um, They work from their home country, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's totally closed, yeah. <laughs> totally closed, and and that's true with uh, just about all offices in in Washington still closed. Mm. How about uh, the chief of IMF also work from home? Yes, I believe so. I believe so. Yes. Okay, so everyone at home. Oh really? Okay. And the meeting also conducted uh, through WebEx or Zoom, right? We use WebEx um, just because that's what they use. I don't know why, <laughs> but Zoom is also good. Uh, this has worked very well, I think. Okay. I like this uh, Q&A feature. So I, if any participant has a question, they can put it in uh, Q&A. Mm. Okay, okay. Yes, and 
uh, how about the time uh, office hours still same or different when you will have VFH? <laughs> With um, Still about the same. Uh, we have some flexibility with office hours, but um, uh, tomorrow actually no one in the office because it's a holiday. But uh, later in the week, I, I will. Uh, they will be in the not in the office, but we will work from normal Washington time. Yes, because here in BPS Statistics Indonesia. We divided uh, the employee into two parts. 50% uh, have to attend the office. Uh, this is uh, apply for Echelon 3, 2, and Echelon 1. And the other, 50% uh, another, uh, doing work from home. So the total employee in the office already only, only 50%. <laughs> But in the IMF, it's interesting, yeah, totally close. <laughs> the office is totally close. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're planning to start opening with just a few people and very gradual. Mm. I think uh, statistics departments will not go anytime soon. Mm. Okay. <laughs> We can work from home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So, teman-teman, yeah, IMF, uh, kantornya tutup semua. <laughs> Kita masih ada yang... <laughs> Ya. Gimana, Tepi? Udah komplit belum? Mas Arbi. Mungkin mau lihat saja, Bu. Uh, sambil teman-teman, karena ada yang masuk di attendant, Bu. Kita sambil uh, moving from attendant to panelist, uh, Andrew can open the lecture. Oh, ya. Yeah. Like okay. yeah. okay, Andrew, this is your time. You can start your lecture. Okay. Okay. Um... It says uh, I'm not able to share my screen. Is uh, can someone make it so I can share the screen? belum di set up. Okay, wait a moment, uh, Andrew. We will check it. Hi. <laughs> Okay, Andrew, you can share now. Okay, thank you. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. 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 Okay, very good. Okay, well, hopefully the uh, quiz wasn't too scary for everybody. Uh, remember, it's, it's uh, okay to get low score at the beginning and then get higher score later. Okay, I'm uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm all uh, set to get started here. So this course this week, we're going to be talking about PPIs for services. So I, I thought I would start here with just uh, some general conversation about why this is important. And so why the bosses uh, at BPS should care, why the central bankers, why the, the policymakers around the world um, who are the customers of these PPIs, why they should care. And services is growing as a share of the worldwide economy. It's happening um, in most countries. And it's happening regardless of the economic cycle. It's, it's generally been, been growing uh, steadily, uh, particularly in developing economies. So since the services sector is growing, we need data 
to accurately measure this sector in the national accounts. And the national accounts will use these SPPIs uh, to deflate real output, to derive real output from uh, nominal output. We also need these services PPI so we can identify service sector productivity. Traditionally, when uh, economists have studied productivity, they think about factories, and um, that's how traditionally uh, labor productivity has been thought of. But as services become a larger part of the economy, um, we need PPIs to help us understand how much real services output um, is produced per employee or per hour of labor. So this chart shows, um, based on 2006 data, uh, the percentage that services make up of the total economy in uh, countries around the world. Um, but generally, it's in almost all countries, it's above 40%. And in more than half of countries, it's over 50% of the economy as of 2016. We expect it's grown since then. And you can see as countries develop and, and move up uh, in, in terms of their, their income, they tend to develop more services. And so uh, Indonesia has been growing very fast over, over the last 10 years. Um, and so we expect that services will continue to grow as a share of, of the Indonesian economy. So in what we call the lower middle income countries, um, in 1991, services was 40% of the economy, and then it's risen to uh, approximately 50% as of 2016. So that's a big move. That's, uh, that's quite a sizable move. And you can see based on where the high income countries are, generally at 65 to 70% of their economy as services, uh, we expect that number to continue to grow as countries uh, develop. So why do we need SPPIs to, when I say SPPIs, sometimes I'll use that phrase for services producer price index. Uh, sometimes I will call them SPPIs. Um, so when there are no SPPIs in a country, national accountants will typically use CPIs to deflate services. And that's the best available option for many countries. Most countries around the world do not produce SPPIs. So as I mentioned before, Indonesia is ahead of, of most other countries with the fact that you already produce some and are expanding to produce more. But when SPPIs are not available, the national accountants will typically use CPIs to deflate services output. And CPIs represent a very different basket from PPIs. CPIs measure domestic expenditure by households, whereas PPIs will measure everything produced by resident firms. So a CPI that looks at uh, resident expenditures will, will completely exclude exports, right? Because if, if a good is exported, it's not consumed by a resident household. CPIs also then would include imports. If Indonesian consumers are, um, are, are spending money on imported goods, that they are gonna show up in the CPI, whereas they would not in a PPI because the PPI is only looking at goods produced by companies uh, within Indonesia, goods or services. And obviously a big difference here is that a CPI in excludes sales to businesses and governments. And there's many service activities where they are dominated by sales to businesses and governments. Warehousing is one example. Freight transportation, which I know you're, you're working on. Um, commercial rents 
is something that would not be in the CPI at all, but is an important part of um, domestic output. Advertising sales, you know, companies uh, that sell advertising on the internet or uh, put advertising on television or radio, that's something a business buys. The business buys the advertising time, not a household. So that would be completely missing from a CPI. And so based on these differences, we see that CPIs and PPIs don't always move alike. So this is uh, in Europe where they aggregate SPPIs across all the Euro area economies. You could see over the period from 2007 to 2018, SPPIs changed far less than services PPIs, uh, excuse me, services CPIs, excuse me. The blue line is CPIs and the orange line is SPPIs. And so that's, I'm graphing here just the, the percentage change in the index, not the index levels. So this change is even more dramatic than it might appear. If, if in 2010, for example, if you used a, a CPI, you'd, you'd be deflating a series that was growing at 2%, whereas if you used the SPPI, it would be growing less than 1%. That's a big difference for a deflator. And we also see a similar pattern in Japan, where the SPPI tends to move a little bit more like nominal uh, GDP than does the, the services CPI. So when you zero in, even on activities that are exactly the same, here I have legal services from the United States. Um, and you can see that the, the CPI for legal services, which would be you know things that if, if an individual needs to make some kind of legal document um, or they are accused of a crime and they need representation, that would be included in a CPI. And those prices were much more volatile in the US than the services PPI, which is more business, uh, services purchased by businesses, large businesses, where prices are a little more stable. So you could see if we didn't have a, a services PPI for legal services, real GDP would probably come out quite a bit different if it was deflated with a CPI as opposed to a services PPI. So that is why SPPIs are important and why we want to produce more of them. And as I mentioned before, productivity is just extremely important for understanding the drivers of economic growth. Um, so, and, and to, to get accurate productivity data for services sectors, we need SPPIs. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit of the intro. Uh, for the rest of this lecture, um, for the rest of this course, over the all five days, our lectures are gonna essentially follow the basic steps of PPI compilation. And these come from the IMF PPI handbook. Um, and these are the, the basic steps that we follow in creating a new PPI. We'll come back to this list in, in each of the lectures that we, we go through this week. But in this first lecture, I'm gonna cover the first two steps determining the objectives, scope, and conceptual basis of the index, and then deciding on our coverage and classification structures. Later on, we'll talk about weighting and sampling and, and most of these other steps. So when we talk about SPPIs, I'm gonna be discuss, uh, discussing compilation of output PPIs. So output means everything that's sold by resident producers. This is in contrast to a wholesale price index, which covers prices for expenditures 
by residents that are not consumers. So that's basically everything that businesses and institutions buy. That's different than an output PPI, which is totally focused on what resident firms are selling. So a wholesale price index would include imported goods because resident businesses would buy imported goods. But an SPPI would not include imports, but would include exports. The ideal coverage of a PPI is the total market output of resident producers, including sales to both the domestic and export markets. And I believe this is the, the concept that you follow with your PPIs at, at BPS. So in this chart, I, I show there's various options for, for these different aspects of PPIs, but this course is gonna cover those options shaded in green. We're gonna talk about output SPPIs that cover all resident units, including those that sell only to the export market. Basically, any company that is producing um, within Indonesia, and we would include sales to all buyers. Now, some countries, including some major countries like Japan uh, and, and Europe, only include sales to businesses in their PPI, what we call B2B, only businesses selling to businesses. However, we recommend coverage of businesses selling to all buyers, including to households. So sometimes this is referred to as B to all. Everything a resident producer sells, regardless of who they sell it to. And of course, under that concept, that would also include exports. In terms of our prices, this is gonna be the same as with industrial PPIs. Most aspects of services PPIs will follow the same rules as industrial PPIs. So things like the, the concepts, the conceptual basis, the scope, they're gonna be the same. Index calculation is gonna be the same as PPI or industrial PPI. However, some of the, the types of prices we use will be very different. And that's why I'm gonna spend a lot of time this week uh, talking about different types of prices that we would be more likely to use with services, PPIs, than we would with industrial PPIs. But um, we prefer to use basic prices, which I, I fully expect is what you, I know you also use for industrial PPIs. So we, do, we don't wanna include value added tax. We wanna exclude all taxes. We want to exclude transportation um, and trade margins. That's transportation is really just an issue for industrial PPI because those are goods that get shipped. Services will not have that transportation aspect to them, um, but they will have trade margins. So generally, we want the price the producer receives, not the price that a reseller would would receive. Um, we'll talk more about that later. So, but this should be the same as industrial PPIs. Preferred is basic prices. The second best is producer prices, which is basically the same as basic prices, ex except that it excludes net subsidies received as a consequence of producing the unit. Ideally, those net subsidies would be included in the prices we collect. Okay, so one thing that I think becomes a little interesting with services um, is the issue of when should prices be recorded? And I have an example here. My, um, I apologize because this, this training lecture was originally given in Thailand. Uh, so a lot of my examples are gonna refer to Thai businesses and they're gonna use bot as the currency. Uh, starting with, with this example here. So let's say we have uh, a flight 
from Bangkok to Chiang Mai. What transactions would we want to include in the October 2019 PPI for air transportation? I could just as easily say July 2020. What transactions should be included? Do you think it should be all ticket sales made in October? Right, so generally people will purchase an air ticket a month or more before they actually fly. So when we uh, compile our current month PPI, should we include all the sales that are made in the current month? That would be option one. Option two would be only ticket sales made in October for flights that occur in October. You people who purchased the ticket this month and also flew this month. Option two. Option three would be all the tickets for flights in October, regardless of when the purchases were made. So some people might have purchased their ticket for the flight this month, six months ago. If we include those transactions, that would be option three. So general PPI rules, which follow from national accounts rules, is that we want to represent prices charged for services that were delivered in the current period. And that includes payments that are made either before or after the current period. This is consistent with the accrual principle used for national accounts. Okay, so what we want to look at is services provided in the reference period, not payments received in the reference period, ideally. It'll be services produced in the reference period. Now, sometimes some services are offered with contracts lasting one year or more, and it's you're unable to break that into prices for a particular period. Uh, an example for this might be a three-year contract for designing and building a bridge. Now, that's something that they're not going to transact every single month. So in, in special cases like that, we have alternative methods that we'll talk about when we get to types of prices. But the general principle is that we want the prices for the services delivered in the reference period. So based on that rule, I would say the best practice would be choice number three here. All the sales for the flights in October, even those that we were paid for in the past. Uh, this is maybe not always be possible, but this is the uh, theoretically best option. Okay, now we can uh, talk about telecommunications a little bit. Consider the price for a telecommunications provider who has an unlimited wireless phone data SMS plan all of those services bundled together. And the subscribers have two options. Um, they could pay $40 a month on a one-year agreement, or they could prepay $350 for the full year. So they get a little bit of a discount because if they had paid every month, they would have to pay, uh, I believe, $480 but they can prepay and get it for 350. So when we are looking at which transaction should we include in the October 2019 PPI, we can think about what's the best option. Option number one would be the total value of all new subscriptions to the plan. So anyone who says, I'm gonna purchase a plan this month, even if it's for service in the future. We can get the value of the new subscriptions to the plan 
only for service provided in October. So we could say if we if we um, if if a customer chooses the prepaid option, we would take 350 divided by 12, and we would take that as our price. That's option two. And then option three is the value of all active subscriptions in October, including the monthly rate for annual contracts signed in prior months. So let's say in January, the provider was selling this plan with a prepaid option at $300. So that customer who might have purchased in January, they might be paying a price uh, that's lower than customers who take the prepaid option today. Maybe there was a price increase between January and October. So if we include that lower price for the January customer in, in our October price, we would choose option number three. This is a, a little tricky of a concept. I'm not sure if you've experienced uh, similar challenges if you, as you've worked on PPIs. Um, but based on the accrual principle, we would say the best option is option three, believe it or not, even though that's kind of difficult to do. We would say, okay, look, who's getting service in October? They're all eligible to be included in the, in the PPI for, for that month. So really, the scope of the PPI that month for this producer should be the value of all active subscriptions in October, including those that got the good rate from last January. Again, that's often hard to do, but from a conceptual point of view, we want to look at all the sales that the pr producer is uh, all, all the revenue that they are receiving for services actually provided in the reference month. Okay, in terms of classification, we use ISIC, Rev4, um, or a national equivalent. Um, and, and if we have a product classification, we use CPC or some kind of uh, a national equivalent classification. So again, the, the classification should be exactly the same as industrial PPIs. Okay. So now I wanna move on to talk about um, thinking about which activities to cover with SPPIs. Um, I know that you already produce some SPPIs and you're currently working on telecommunications and freight transportation. And maybe once uh, those projects are concluded, then maybe you think about moving on to other uh, services activities. So I have some categories that I, I recommend as factors for you to consider when thinking about which activities to cover with SPPS. So this is not this is my advice, basically. This is not a rule set in stone, but based on my experience working with SPPIs over many years, I think there are six key factors uh, that I recommend that you consider when thinking about which service activities to cover. The first one is the prevalence of market pricing. Activities provided without market prices are nearly always excluded from the PPI. So what is a market price? You know, there's not a great perfect definition of a market price, but I think the best one I've found is that market prices are the results of negotiated agreements between buyers and sellers. If you have a service where everyone has to buy it at a particular price, that's not a market price anymore. That's some kind, of, you know, and there's many services that may be offered at non-market prices. Um, typically services provided by the government are provided without market prices. 
typically. That's not always the case, but typically. So examples of ISICs that are often uh, provided without market prices are things like public administration. You know, um, there's no price that everyone pays for the services of BPS. It's generally a service provided without a market price. Um, often primary education, if it's offered by the government, um, if it's offered by the private sector, that's a different issue that then they might have market prices. Any uh, health services that are offered by the government may or may not be sold with market prices. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. I think the, the situation varies in different countries. But in any case, if you have sectors within, uh, within the services, uh, ISICs, that are provided without market prices, that's areas we don't want to touch with an SPPI. So once we've excluded those, the next factor we could consider is the relative importance of the activity to the total economy. So that's, you look at, at, at the national accounts, you see which one has the largest contribution to GDP, and that's a pretty good start. Once you exclude uh, those services that are offered without market prices. Okay, so, so now what I would basically take that list as my starting point, which are the biggest service activities uh, that are offered with market prices. And then I would think about, okay, where do we already have pretty good deflators? Um, and generally we said the national accounts are gonna use CPIs. So, the national accountants will probably be able to use a, a CPI pretty well if a service is primarily sold to resident households, because that's the scope of the CPI. But anywhere where you have sales to businesses and institutional buyers, that's where an SPPI is going to be most needed. So again, freight transportation that you're working on now, that's a, a perfect category for uh, creating an SPPI because many of those, those services are not bought, purchased by households. Um, telecommunications is an example of an activity that's purchased by both uh, businesses and households, but because a significant portion of it is sold to businesses, um, that's also a very good choice for, for coverage with an SPPI. If your uh, statistics from your business surveys or any other source have any information on sales by type of buyer, how much is sold to households and how much is sold to businesses, uh, that could be helpful in, in considering this factor. Your national accountants will typically know. I think we have some people from national accounts with us uh, this week. Um, so, so they'll have a good sense of, of what services are primarily sold for investment or for or just sold to businesses uh, as opposed to sales to households for household expenditures. So generally CPIs are sufficient for national accounts for food and beverage service. Uh, anything that's any ISICs that specifically mention households so rental and leasing of household goods, um, arts, entertainment, and recreation, that's mostly sold to households. So um, CPIs would be adequate there. Uh, personal service activities, such as, as barbers and hairdressers, um, those types of services would not be typically the top choices for SPPIs because the CPIs will be perfectly suitable for deflation. Another very important factor to consider is the cost and complexity of data collection. Some service activities are gonna be pretty easy to collect data for, and some are gonna be really hard. 
In my opinion, the most significant factor in driving cost and complexity of data collection is the industry concentration or the percentage of sales generated by the largest companies. If a large proportion of sales come from a few companies, you can produce a representative index with a pretty small sample. Um, telecommunications might be an example of a service that you can generally get pretty good coverage with only a few firms. An example of, of a service activity that is, has low levels of concentration would be supermarkets. There are supermarkets all over the country, food shops all over the country. So to get an adequate sample of all the food shops, uh, you, you'd need to spend a lot of money to collect a lot of units. If price information is available at a single central location for large companies, this also simplifies data collection and makes it less, less expensive because we, we don't need as many data collectors out in the field um, if we can collect price information at a single central location for a large firm. Okay, so service industries or activities that typically have high concentration in, are in the transportation sector, right? Air transport, rail transport, I mentioned telecommunications, also things like broadcasting, television, there's usually not many providers. Internet services, there may be a lot of providers, but generally activity is heavily concentrated in your large providers. So that could be another area that makes sense um, to cover SPPIs with. Low concentration, like I mentioned, retail and wholesale trade, repair and motor vehicles. There's typically many, many shops around uh, the country. Uh, real estate activities can also be uh, widely distributed amongst uh, many establishments. Another factor for cost and complexity is any ISIC activity that starts with the word other, you find these throughout the ISIC classification. So for example, something like other information technology and computer services activities. Sometimes these activities have quite a bit of sales associated with them. So if you're looking at which are, are the biggest contributors to the services uh, output, you might find some of these other activities are significant but they're very challenging to collect because generally they represent a large variety of activities that often have very different price determining characteristics. So that means there's a lot of different services you'd have to understand and prepare your data collectors to collect. Um, also these other categories, if the other categories are getting very large, that means that there's some service activity that's growing pretty fast. And what typically will happen is that they'll make a new ISIC for that activity. Like some of the internet services we saw started out in these ISIC other categories. And then when they got really big, ISIC expanded and made a new four digit to cover internet activities. So you don't really wanna spend a lot of time and effort making SPPIs for these other categories, because if they start pulling things out to make new ISICs, you're gonna lose your continuity of your data series anyway. So um, I, as a compiler, I never liked having to do other activities and I would try to convince my bosses not to do them. And another factor is the complexity of constant quality pricing. Generally, any service activity that has non-recurring transactions is going to be difficult to price. We do have some methods for these types of services, which I'll talk about when we get to types of prices. Uh, but generally, it's going to be harder to create price indexes for these activities. Some examples that I give here are scientific research and development 
generally every research and development project is unique. So it's very hard to say, you know, this is the price for this specific service and track that over time. Motion picture production. I don't know if uh, if there's a lot of that in Indonesia. I'm sure there's some. Um, you know, every movie is different. So the studios who make the movies, it's it's very hard to get a consistent basis to form a price index. And we often see this also with professional services. So I gave the example earlier of building a bridge. You know, an engineering firm works on building one bridge. They're never going to build that bridge again. So it's more difficult to um, create a matched model with the same product being sold each subsequent period. Oh, another aspect of complexity of constant quality pricing um, is where output prices are not directly observable. And a, 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 there are two areas which represent a lot of services output in most countries, but where output prices are not directly observable. First one is retail and wholesale trade. Okay. If you're looking at the prices of the actual goods in the store, that's covered by the CPI. So let's say we have a supermarket and you want to know the price of fruit in that store. The CPI will collect that. As the PPI, we are interested in measuring the output of the supermarket. Okay. And based on the concepts from national accounts, the retail and wholesale trade sector, their output is not the fruit or the vegetables. It's the retailing and wholesaling service. So in the national accounts, retail and wholesale trade is measured based on the margin between the price at which the retailer purchases the product and the price at which they sell it. That represents their output. So to create a PPI for retail and wholesale trade, we would have to identify that margin between the price at which they purchase the good and the price at which they sell it. It's not easy to do. <laughs> it can be done, but it's very difficult. <laughs> Another uh, similar se sector is banking. Banking, again, could be very large, uh, depending on the country. Um, but based on national accounts rules, banking is measured uh, with the FISM concept. It's a word that only means something to people who work in national accounts. And it basically means financial services indirectly measured. So the difference between how much interest is receivable, well, actually it's even more complex than that. You have one price for loans and you have another price for deposits. And the price is the difference between some reference rate and the interest they charge on loans or the interest they pay on deposits. There are um, countries that, that do banking PPIs. I worked on them in the United States, so they can be done, but it's certainly a complex area that would not be one of the first areas you'd want to try to cover with SPPIs. And finally, and, and often the most important factor is what your users want. <laughs> what kind of data are they looking for? And your key users are going to be your national account staff, productivity researchers, economic policymakers, staff at the central bank. And if you have regular communication with your key users, it'll be easier for you to get a sense of what deflators they really need to be produced. So very important factor. OK. I know we're a little bit over time, but what I would like to do now, if we could, is um, maybe first I'll just stop and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. You could either, if you wanna talk, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll defer to our organizers here. Um, I would say either you could ask it or you could write it and I could try to get to any questions and, and then I would like to, to talk a little bit about 
uh, your plans at BPS for working on SPPIs. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew, for the presentation. Uh, maybe we have, uh, if uh, there is any question, please uh, raise your hand or uh, uh, send it to the chat column. Uh, but we have already four participants. First, uh, for Pak. Imade Putra Astawa, you can ask the question. Mr. Imade Putra. Or maybe the next participant, Mr. Sahunan from BPS Sutra. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Mrs. Sahunan. Uh, mohon maaf untuk Pak Imade Putra, mungkin bisa di-unmute dulu, Pak. Belum terdengar, Pak. Belum terdengar, Pak. Next dulu kali Dep. Oke, okay. Ibu Sahunan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry actually this is my raised hand for uh, presensi presensi. <laughs> But uh, I will ask something uh, about uh, PP. I see someone asked a, a very hard question in the chat. Ya, atau kalau misalnya nggak uh, bisa dalam bahasa Inggris, bisa dalam bahasa Indonesia, nanti mungkin dicoba untuk ditranslate ke Andrew. Silakan Bapak Ibu. Any question? Hal Hello, can I ask yeah. something? Yes, please, Mrs. Kadekari. Uh, uh, hello, Mr. Andrew. Uh, previously, I sent you a chat, and I directly I would like to ask something you, with you. As you mentioned in, on previous slide, uh, activities provide without market price are uh, nearly always exclude for PPIs. Uh, I'm from I'm from expenditure account and I'm in charge in general go, general government account. So I would like to ask, uh, what is suitable price index for non-market activities, especially for general government and such as uh, public administration? Uh, am I clear? Oh yes, very clear. Thank yeah. you. It's Thank an excellent you. question. Now, 
I'm a price index uh, person. Uh, you are national accounts. I feel like you probably know the answer better than I do, but um, I will try. <laughs> uh, in my experience, normally as a price index, we don't create price indexes for public administration. Um, and most of the times they are deflated by based on cost information for the government sector. So any information about uh, costs, what expenses of, of, uh, of government. I think they make cost-based deflators, but I, I apologize that I am not a, a national accounts expert, <laughs> um, but I, I would be happy to, to try to, uh, actually, I, I think uh, the IMF has produced some documents on deflating government expenditures, and I can try to uh, locate those and, and send them on, because it's an excellent question. So there is no PPI for service for general government, and uh, maybe uh, we we uh, now in uh, in a, a national account we try to uh, looking for a good index for general government too, and I hope you can uh, give me some advice or maybe some can best country practice maybe for uh, for a. Uh, for maybe for price index for uh, general government, maybe. Can you give me some best country practice? Thank you. Sure. So, so what, what I will do is I will share a note that was compiled by some of my national account expert uh, colleagues um, that I is about deflating the government account. And I will, I will send that on. Um, uh, and um, and then maybe if you have a chance to take a look at it, see if it's still unclear and I could try to, to gather some more information. Okay, uh, I will be glad if you send me and I, I waited for that data or that, uh, that national practice. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Thank you, um, Mrs. Kadek. Uh, and then for the next, question uh there is a question at the chat column from mr or mrs nuri in my region ppi on services like health and education is the same with cpi because it's direct no margin or transport yeah that's an so excellent is... excellent question um um so generally, health and education would be the same between a CPI and a PPI if the entire amount that the producer receives comes from what the household pays. But if the producer is getting some, some payment from another payer, whether it's a business who might purchase something or more likely the government, then those revenue streams are not included in the CPI typically. Um, and again, I know countries have very various practices with healthcare. Um, I worked in the United States, which has a very unique healthcare system um, where many payments are coming from the government to the hospitals. And so those would be included in a PPI, but not included in a CPI. But yes, you are absolutely correct. Um, that there would be no margin or transport involved there. Um, so, but, and, and in some countries, uh, um, if, if the total price of school is paid by the household, then yes, CPI and PPI would be the same. It's only when there's some payment received um, from someone other than a household that you would have a difference. And again, it's not just payments, right? It has to be a net subsidy as a consequence of performing a service. So if they're paying, if the government pays for certain patients who get a certain procedure, then that would be considered um, a market transaction that would be included for a PPI, but maybe would not be included in a CPI. But again, that varies by country and it's an excellent question. 
I see here also we have a question about telecommunications. Maybe I could, I could take this one. Um, and, and this would be something we can talk more about on, I, I believe, Wednesday, if I have the days right. I want to talk more in detail about telecommunications with the folks working on it. Um, but how to calculate the monthly subscription if the subscription is for a year. There's going to be a couple different approaches we can talk about, but one one method that's commonly used for telecommunications is to use a unit value price, where we look at all the revenue that's coming into the provider um, for all the plans that are active. And that would include a, a, a per month price, even for those annual subscribers. Um, it's a very good question. I'm going to come back to that in detail. So we'll talk more about that on, on Wednesday. But, um, you know, sometimes if there are services that are generally sold in an increment longer than a month, we could still collect those prices in a monthly index. We could track, you know, what's the yearly price paid by people who are purchasing this service now and include that as our price for the monthly index. Um, but like I said, I have some slides. We'll talk a little bit more about different pricing methods later, but that's a great question. Um, and I apologize, but we will get to that. Um, um, so I see here another question about education. Um, Primary activities often provided without market prices, especially primary education, because there are subsidies. Now, remember, in a basic price, net subsidies provided as a consequence of producing a good or service are supposed to be included, ideally, if we can. So there's a, a difference between a subsidy that's just, I give you an amount of money to operate for the whole year, and on the other hand, um, a subsidy that is provided for each unit of service that's, that's performed. Um, I'm interested, maybe when we, we talk later, we can talk about the, the Dana BOS. I, uh, it's always interesting to me because these uh, services like education and health are transacted very differently in, very, in different countries. So. Um, we, we could uh, talk about that more when, when we maybe have the smaller section with the, with the price statisticians of, of headquarters, but um, that's the general rule on subsidies. We wanna include them if they're a consequence of producing the unit. Yeah, so uh, subsidies for, for poor residents. Um, Again, so it just matters in terms of how that subsidy is allocated, whether it's, if, if the government pays the subsidy that says when this student takes the class, you receive this payment, it's for a specific defined service, that could be included in a price. Uh, if, it's, if, it's, um, if it's not provided as a, on, on a kind of consequence of providing a specific service, just a general amount given to schools that serve poor students, uh, then that would not be included in a market transaction. I see here, another question here about, um, I said that services transaction without market prices are nearly always excluded from PPIs. And, uh, the question was, are there any exceptions? Um, different, I, I've seen countries produce indexes for, for goods without market service, without market prices. Um, in my experience, compiling PPIs in the US, there were no exceptions. It was a rule for us. If there was no market price, we would not produce an index. Other countries I've seen have taken different kinds of, of prices, um, but I would need to evaluate those and see what they're doing. Uh, um, so in my direct experience, the answer, I would not recommend ever creating PPIs um, for services or goods that are offered without market prices, because that means whatever you're tracking, it, it's not a price. <laughs> um, uh, 
I think prices are a necessary uh, requirement for making a price index. So, um, but there, there are different situations and they would have to be evaluated individually. Some countries do create certain kinds of alternative indexes, but it's not using methods that um, are covered in this course or that uh, I train on, let's put it that way. Okay, maybe I can, uh, I'll keep going here. There's a, a question about sample of price recording for air transportation. Will there be a different chosen option if we use direct pricing? Okay, so we're skipping a little bit ahead um, because we're gonna talk about these types of pricing options later. Um, I agree it's the most interesting part of the course. Um, will there be a different chosen option if we use direct pricing? So if you use direct pricing, the, the universe of transactions that are eligible to be included in your PPI would be those for services that took place in the reference period. So even if you're using a direct price, you'd say, let me look at who bought the tickets for this flight that occurred this month, this reference period month. And if the transaction took place in a previous month, that would be eligible to be included in the reference period PPI. That's the concept. And, and that comes from the national accounts. You know, if, if we think about the PPI as a deflator that aligns with um, out, nominal output measures, those nominal output measures are coming from services performed in the current period. It's the accrual accounting concept. So um, I think the best way for me to explain it is to say that the, in theory, it's always best to get a price for the service provided in the current month. And if you look at only um, purchases made in the current month, that may not be fully representative of all the services that were provided in the current month. Now, I fully acknowledge that for many circumstances, we're not able to achieve that theoretical ideal. And, and that's common. You know, when I worked on SPPIs, we had to make a lot of compromises, as I'm sure every compiler does around the world. There's the theoretically perfect um, method, and then there's what we can achieve with realistically with what we can collect from businesses and um, what we can compile quickly. So those trade-offs um, are, are, are done all the time. But here in this lecture, I was just talking about the con concepts. And from a conceptual basis, the ideal is to collect prices for services provided in the current period. Okay, I'm gonna take a, a, a few more questions and then, um, um, the, and then maybe some discussion about what your current activities in Indonesia, and then we'll move on to the next lecture. Um, let me go back here, make sure I've covered all these questions that have come in. Um, in my province, the dominant transportation is sea and air transport. What if during the pandemic data cannot be collected? Excellent question. Um, so uh, at the IMF, we put together a note that talks about continuity of PPIs um, during the pandemic. Um, some of the slides I, I will cover when we get to index calculation come from, from that presentation. When no, you know, if there's no sea transportation occurring now for, for any given provider, we will impute prices is, is the practice we would recommend. So, so later on this week, I will give you an example of, of how to do that imputation. Um, but that is our recommended practice. If, if there are businesses that are not offering services or goods right now, or they're just not responding, maybe because they're, they're, you know, we, we've seen response rates go down with the current pandemic around the world. Um, best practice is to impute missing prices. And we are gonna cover that on Thursday, or I believe. Um, so stay tuned. That's an excellent question, a really, really good question. Um,
Um, there's some questions about about the the presentation about the timing of when to record prices. Um, if panel, if uh, participants are interested, maybe I could stay on a little bit after we finish at uh, 11 a.m. and and I could take some of those questions just so we can continue to move on here. Um, agricultural PPI. There's many commodities not produced continuously. That's that's exactly right. So what we call seasonally available goods and services. Um, agricultural PPIs would not typically be included in, in, in service PPIs, but best practice for seasonally available goods is also to impute the prices. Now, there may be some different practices we use for seasonally available services, of which there are not that many. But if, if something is only seasonally available, um, I, I'm going to talk about that a little bit with uh, uh, accommodation services, which sometimes some um, providers would only be open in certain seasons. Um, but imputation is going to be our, our preferred answer there as well. Even when something is not produced for a certain number of months every year, we still impute prices for that product. That's the recommended practice for both the CPI and the PPI. So, so we'll cover imputation uh, on Thursday and um, we could talk about how that gets implemented in PPIs in practice. Do you think that PPIs will give the same result with CPI when the service being produced is being consumed entirely as personal expenditure? The results should be exact. There, there are still a couple differences that may be important. Even if all of this, the services for a given activity are um, purchased by resident households. The first is the treatment of, of um, transportation and trade margins, if they're a factor at all, because those would be included in, in the prices for CPI, but excluded from the PPI. So, you know, sometimes that tr those trade margins sometimes come into play with services. So uh, let me try to think of a good example. Um, you know, even it, it's different in different countries, but even some telecommunication services, what a, a household pays, there might be a middleman between the telecommunications company and the household who is like a reseller. Um, and if they take a margin, that would be included in the price of the service for CPI, but would not be included in the basic price for a PPI. Um, you also sometimes will see that within the uh, travel sector, accommodations or airlines. Sometimes an airline will use uh, an agent to sell the tickets. So if we look at the price from the household, they might include the, the fees taken by those agents whereas that would not be included in a PPI for the airline directly. Um, so that's one factor that would still make them a little bit different. But again, the more alike, you know, it, it's not, example, uh, it's not um, an example of being exactly the same. It's about being more similar if most of the sales are to resident households. Um, but of, again, of course, another difference is that the PPI would include exports whereas the CPI would not, obviously, because uh, a resident household didn't purchase those goods. And um, CPIs would also include imported goods, which could have some distorting effect, um, you know, particularly when there's significant differences in, in uh, foreign exchange and things like that. Some goods might become more expensive in the CPI uh, that are not accruing to resident producers. So, um, there still can be some differences, but generally, the more sales are to resident households, the more alike the CPI and PPI would be. Um, uh, sorry, Andrew. Yes. Maybe uh, we can continue our agenda first before Absolutely. we continue the our discussion. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm very appreciative of all these questions. And... Oh, yeah. um, um, I'm going to make sure I could provide my email. I'd be happy to answer questions through email uh, as well later. Um, okay. And, and, and maybe I'll try after we finish with the session today to go back through the chat and uh, try to write out some answers. So thank you. 
Okay. Okay. So yeah. just One quickly, uh, maybe maybe um, just for the next ten minutes, maybe we can discuss a little bit about about the efforts that are going on at BPS now, uh, and then at, at starting at um, after ten minutes, I'll move on to the next lecture on sampling and weighting. So so. Um, my understanding, and, and you sent some information to me before we started here, was that um, I could see the SPPIs that you currently produce on your website, and that you also now have collected data for telecommunications and freight transportation. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, what specific services you're including in those areas? Is it all of telecommunications, like wired telecommunications and wireless telecommunications? Is it the entire sector? And then similarly okay, for freight transportation, uh, are you including air and sea and rail and road and all these different aspects or are you just um, focusing on, on particular areas at this point? Yeah, oh, maybe we have already prepared our presentation about uh, our progress and plans for SPPI at BPS. Maybe uh, Mrs. Uh, Sri and Dani can uh, present our uh, progress and plans oh. for the SPPI at BPS. Mrs. Sri, the time is yours, please. Cepi bisa di share screen yang materi dari SHP. Dep. Gimana? Materi yang mana ya? Sebentar, sebentar. Okay. 
Thank you, Mbak Devi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, good morning, everyone, and good evening for Pak Andrew. Uh, sorry for being late because I have a problem with my uh, laptop. I hope you can hear me. Bisa, Bu. Okay. Okay. Um, I would like to present the progress for producing PPI for services in Indonesia. I hope that you can see my presentation. <clears throat> I would like to talk about uh, the progress of SPPI in general, and then talking about the telecommunication sector, um, freight transport sector, and passenger transport sector, education sector, and the last is health sector. <clears throat> okay, as you can see, you already mentioned in your previous um, presentation that uh service sector contribute quite a lot in developing gdp in our gdp is around 50 percent served by this uh service sector so that's why we are starting to calculate this PPI for services. As you can see here, that we start to collect the information from subsector transportation as it contribute 4.19% in 19 producing GDP and for telecommunication, uh, telecommunication around 2.13%. And education is around 2.32%. And uh, public health and social activities is around 2.5%. one point fourteen percentage. So that's why in starting two thousand fourteen we start collecting all the data from the accommodation and food services, passenger transport, water supply, telecommunication and electricity and gas supply. And then we make a release first only including for accommodation and food beverage services. And then in 2016, we included another subsector from the services, which is a passenger transport services. And we try to extend our collection by including freight transport and telecommunication. In 2017, the press release for this SPPI, including for electricity and gas supply. At the same time, we try to extend our in-depth study by covering health and education services. At the same time, we try to, uh, to collect the data from this subsector. <clears throat> in 2018, we calculate this SCPI including education and health services. And then in 2019, 
we make another extent by doing the in-depth study. By looking at properly for all the problem in all of these uh, subsector services. In 2020, we hope that we can uh, make a press release, but unfortunately we have a budget restraint. We have to uh, reduce our budget. So we just uh, make a, another in-depth study by looking at uh, review and based on references, maybe just an administration uh, data to look through all these uh, services sector. That's uh, so far that we are doing for this SDPI development until now. Based on our challenges so far from 2014, we try to make a work plan. And this is um, subject to change because of the budget that maybe in the future we have to make an adjustment. That in 2020 now, we hope that we can make a PPI calculation for the first quarter. We hope that in, uh, and, uh, in the second quarter and third quarter, we can start to produce the <clears throat> press release. <clears throat> The next step for the information and communication, we hope that we can uh, produce the calculation also in this year. And in 2021 to 2022, we still make an in-depth study for warehousing and support activities for transportation, postal career activities, whether uh, this um, contribution still quite low actually, but we still uh, look through whether we can uh, produce this uh, PPI, including PPI services for this subsector. The next two years, uh, 2022 and 2023, we will start in the study for construction that might be the possibility that we can produce the SDPI, including this uh, construction. <clears throat> in the next year, 2023 and 2024, we look through professional scientific and technical activities. This is still um, quite ambitious, I guess, that we we will try to uh, still look through if there is no many obstacles, maybe we can produce, including this subsector. And the last is for financial insurance and activity. I think that's quite, uh, as you can see, quite uh, ambitious uh, work plan. We hope that we can still look through all the data that already available since 2014 based on in-depth study or starting from the collection that we try to make our data collection can produce a good quality of SPPI before we extend more or adding more subsector in services. Until we, I guess we 
be sure that we can produce by adding more subsector in services in terms of good quality. Now we can see from each subsector in services, start from the telecommunication sector. I guess the same uh, what you already mentioned that for the weight and basket that we are using uh, from the input output table. We use from the 2010 past year. And for the detailed product weights, we are look at from the wire voice text data and wireless voice and text data. For the sampling frame, based on the economic census 2016, we also uh, look at from the directory from our line ministry for these services. And uh, for pricing method, we use direct use of price uh, for the services. We collect the information from the first day each month until 15 of the day. The challenge for this subsector of telecommunication that we still have low response rate as you can see, we have a uh, three uh, company in this area, but we cannot collect easily for this information. As the substitute, we get the information from the the fourth uh, biggest and the fifth biggest of uh, telecommunication companies. That's why. Uh, uh, I think that we have to look uh, where, whether the data that we get from this uh, as a substitute can, uh, maybe you can give us advice whether we can use this information as a substitute when the big companies that as a target cannot give the information for us. And also the challenges is that uh, many variation the product they produce that quite uh, uh, make us need to consider whether this variety need also to include in our uh, SDPI. And also from the telecommunication, I don't know whether in America also having the same uh, problem. Uh, we are dealing with bundle pricing that the product, uh, they sell the product, including with the gadget, that the bundle pricing that we cannot uh, separate. Sometimes we cannot separate how much is actually the, the gadget and the, the telecommunication product they sell. And also we, it, it is not easy to monitor this kind of uh, uh, price that they sell. Because sometimes they sell different bundling for a different gadget. For freight transport sector, the current condition, we include freight railway transport, freight land transport, Red Sea, Inland Water and Coastal Transport, and right, Air Transport. We collect for the sampling frame from the Economic Census 2016, Directory of Transportation Establishment, but also we compare with the directory that we get from the line ministry. The pricing method contract price and direct use of prices and repeated services. The collection period still the same with the telecommunication sector. The challenge is still the same that we 
facing the low response rate because it's not easy when dealing with a big company. I guess they are not willingly to give the information to us. And also that we still have problem to identify the price movement in 2015, 2000, uh, 2010, 2015. I guess this is dealing with the way that we need to see as a basement. For the passengers transport sector, almost the same with the freight transportation, which is railway transport, land transport, sea, inland water and coastal transport, and air transport. For this passenger transport, the data source for the survey, the price that we collect is including the price for weekdays and weekend. We acknowledge this because we know that for weekday and weekend price quite a uh, different uh, price that quite large uh, difference. That's why we have to include these uh, prices. The challenges for these passenger transportations, the same that we are facing for low response rate, and the price movement, as you know, that for the passenger transportation is because we are dealing with the same uh, as CPI. They use uh, I guess the CPI is uh, more stabilized in terms of collecting the information. So sometimes that for this um, data, we just use the CPI information when we cannot get the information from our target. For the education sector, the coverage is for including public education and private education. Start from primary school, middle school, high school, and university. The sampling frame, we use the directory that uh, collect by the education ministry. The pricing method, we use direct use of price and repeated services. For administrative data, as a comparison, we collect government school operational assistance funds because sometimes that the school cannot provide this information. As you can see that the public education share quite large in uh, input output table is around 1.37 percentage. And private only 0.93. The challenge, I guess, because sometimes that we have incomplete, incomplete information in the tariff of services provided. Sometimes that because the questionnaire that we get from the school, they cannot give detailed information. At the end, we only have a bundle of a uh, price or uh, services that is not easy to uh, when we try to make a comparison with the previous price. Because of budget constraint, we also cannot conduct training for our enumerator. Maybe that contribute 
the quality of the data that we collect for this SPPI. For the health sector, I guess almost the same with the previous subsector. We collect all our target from the directory of hospital from Ministry of Health. And we use direct use of price and repeated services. And the collection still the same from the first day to 15 day of each month and this is the weight and the challenge is that the price data are still found in the form of price range due to the specification of services are not clear or detailed yet and also because we are not clearly uh, understand the services that produced by each of hospital or uh clinic that's why sometimes that we cannot uh make it in a detail uh, or make an adjustment based on this price range i hope that based on this information you can uh give us solution or give us advice and andrew how we can uh move from this challenge to produce a good quality SPPI. That's all that we can uh, say. Thank you, Andrew, for the time that uh, you give for us to explain about the progress of this SPPI in BPS. Back to uh, Debbie as the host. Thank you. Thank you, Gusri. So maybe Andrew, you want to give some response, or we continue yes. our agenda? <laughs> no, this was this was uh, okay. extremely helpful for me. Yeah. Um, so thank you very very much. Um, it seems to me that um, maybe. Uh, a big objective would be to see if we can publish this freight transportation and telecommunications data, right? We've collected it. There are some challenges with it, but maybe we see how we could um, resolve those challenges so we can move towards uh, publishing it. Yes? Yeah. Um, by the way, Andrew, yes. um, uh, I apologize that uh, there is an invitation because we have a new our new deputy. So I have to uh, attend the promo uh, the promotion. What is the call promotion ceremony? So okay. uh, <laughs> I hope that my colleagues here can uh, explain to you anything that you need to know further about our progress. Well, this is great. Okay. I can take this information and we can use it for conversations later on in the week. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Okay. So, so maybe, so that was very helpful for me because, um, and, and again, I, I think on Wednesday, we're going to spend a lot of time uh, um, discussing where we where we are and where we want to get to and and how we could work together to 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 do that um so that information was extremely helpful to to make that conversation productive on wednesday so in our, in our um limited time um you know I, I i think i would like to answer the remaining questions if we can just to make sure that that people um um, get responses, um, and then I could quickly go through sampling and waiting. And if we if we need some more time on that, I could start with it again okay. tomorrow. Okay. Um, I, 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 thank you. I, I just want to see if I could uh, um, get to some of these additional questions before I, I, I move on. 
Um, and, and there's a lot of questions I have about, you know, how healthcare works in Indonesia and what kind of prices you're collecting. And uh, I look forward to talking about that more uh, later this week. Um, so, um, and also interesting with some of the services that you're pricing, like education, I'm curious, you know, how would that vary between a CPI and a PPI? Uh, um, so that, that'll be some of the things that, again, I'd like to discuss with you on Wednesday. Um, are they basically coming out the same? Should they be the same? Um, and also, I take it that your PPI, is it voluntary for businesses? Or is it mandatory? Voluntary. Uh, I think it's a uh, voluntary. I had the same in the uh, United States, voluntary. Almost all countries in the world, it's mandatory. But I had the same problem as you. I had voluntary when I work on PPI. So I know it's very difficult to get response. Um, when you're dealt with a situation where you have a couple of very large important firms and none of them will participate, uh, I'm gonna see if maybe we could talk about, are there other things we could do to try to get participation from these companies? Are they already completing some kind of regulatory price reports? And can we try to see if we can align the PPI collection more with those existing reports. I, I know I'm sure you've tried uh, everything you can, but, but I look forward to discussing that more with you on, on Wednesday. Um, okay. You know what, maybe it would be best if I go to sampling and waiting just because I'm having trouble getting through, all, uh, looking, finding all these questions and I'll try to write down the questions and come back to them uh, tomorrow. Okay, so sampling and waiting. Let me pull up that presentation. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so we'll talk about waiting and sampling. I think for for those of you who are very experienced with PPIs, this is going to be uh, information you're very familiar with. For those of you who are newer, hopefully um, it will help explain some of the, the basics of PPI compilation, which will always involve finding some weights uh, for activities, products, and maybe items, um, and then designing a sample. And it was interesting to me that you're using a lot of lists from other government agencies. Um, that makes a lot of sense. So when we talk about weights in this course, there are three main types of weights. Activity weights, detailed product weights, and then item weights. Now, I know different countries use different terminologies. So I'm gonna to try to describe it the way I'm familiar with it. And then maybe I'll learn how, what, what words you're using for some of these concepts and I can adjust to, to your language. But uh, let me try to explain what I mean when I use these three phrases. I think activity weights is, is kind of um, the most clear, right? You, you have a, a certain weight for health, for education, for transportation, um, so, so those are our activity weights. Um, and we said usually we're, we're using ISIC, Rev4. Um, and activity weights ideally are production values. What was the total production of all businesses classified in this activity in the reference year? And production value is sales plus change in inventories. Now, one of the good things about services is we don't have to worry about inventories. So for services, production values and sales should be the same. Okay, so we just can take the total sales for all the companies in the weight reference period. And so I think for your PPIs, the weight reference period is 2010. 
and you are aligned with national accounts, when they update, you update as well. That um, strikes me as fine. Um, if you have a business survey that goes out more frequently, you could consider updating weights with that more frequently, but that's uh, a choice. Um, so gen generally activity weights come from, if you do an economic census, most countries do not, that's one source, or just your regular business survey that could often have good information about total sales um, of businesses classified in particular ISIC activities. Other potential sources are business registers and tax data. I know now you're using the national accounts data, um, which is very suitable. So the activity weights I mentioned are, are those ISIC activities. If you have detailed categories of indexes, within the ISIC, basically more detailed than the four-digit ISIC, um, then that's what I'm calling a product weight. It's not, the pro it's not a weight associated with a particular company or a particular transaction from the company. It's for all production of all firms for this product. And sometimes I don't I don't know if your national accounts, yeah, they probably do produce weights at this detailed level, which is 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 good. So you probably get them from there. Uh, but sometimes you're left with a situation where you only get uh, weights from, let's say, a business survey at the activity level, but then you need to figure out the product level. But generally, you want these to align with your activity weights, these product weights. Um, they should come from the same wet weight reference period, and they should be as consistent as possible with those activity weights. Um, I go through some examples here, which I, I think I'm going to kind of skip over in the interest of time here. But um, um, there are, were many cases I could tell you about my experience with PPIs. Um, we got all of the activity weights from the economic census, which is done every five years in the United States. It's basically a big business survey. We call it a census, even though it's really a survey. Um, and then, but the detailed product weights were often not available from that source. So we had to get creative with looking for other sources that could tell us how much of the revenue of an activity was broken out into these different product groupings. And sometimes that came from regulatory agencies or from private sources. You know, sometimes trade groups would give certain information and we would try to use as much of that as possible in coming up with these product weights. Um, so like I said, the ideal case is you're getting this from a business survey or in your case, national accounts. If you have not only here the, the four digit Actually, these are product codes, but uh, ISIC here would be 6120 mobile telecommunication services. And then if you wanted to have detailed indexes for things like voice and text and data, you know, that would be your detailed product weight, more detailed than the four digit ISIC. Um, I have an example here that shows how you could use third party data to get these weights if they're not available in your source. I think I'm going to skip over them and, and you have them here. If, if this is relevant for you, uh, you can look through this information and you could ask me for questions about it um, offline. Um, but that's what those slides are describing, a case where you have activity weights from your primary source, but you don't have product weights. And sometimes countries will say, well, look, if we don't have product weights, we, we can't create detailed indexes for them. And in reality, sometimes you can, just being creative about which sources you're using. And sometimes that will improve the quality of your activity uh, index um, by creating those detailed product categories, even if you don't have perfect sources. Um, sometimes that could be really important. Um, you know. Think of it, uh, an example, you know, for, for 
freight air transportation, maybe sometimes the prices are very different if it's for you know, goods that are shipped in bulk and those goods that are shipped that have to be cooled. You know, Sometimes the things that are being shipped overnight, like fresh food, they're gonna pay different prices than those things that are shipped um, in, in bulk. Uh, so if you're getting very different price trends between these different categories, creating separate indexes improves the quality of imputation, which we'll talk about on Thursday. Um, and often that could have a significant factor in improving the quality of the overall index by creating these detailed product indexes. Um, now, if you read things like the IMF PPI manual, if you are very bored and you'd like to read these kinds of very boring manuals, you will see a lot of discussion about low indexes and young indexes. Um, I found this very confusing myself as a compiler, um, but generally what this refers to is that you have a set of activity weights from a, a reference period. So in your case, your activity weights are coming from the 2010 national accounts. Now you might go collect a telecommunications company and start introducing your telecommunications indexes in 2000. 20. Okay, so you might want to update those weights from 2010, doing something we call price updating the weights. So we're not going to take take completely new weights until we we reweight everything in the PPI. Generally, you do those those reweights for all the activities all at one time. When the 2020 weights are available, I'm expecting that you will go and do a full reweight of the PPIs based on that 2020 information. But if you introduce some activities, let's say in 2019, and that 2020 information is not available yet, you might want to price update the 2010 weights. I'll, I'll explain this in, in a moment. Um, if you use price updated weights, we call that a low index. If you use index without price updated weights, that's called the young index. Both methods are acceptable. Okay, and it gets very tricky with um, index methodology to think about which one is might be might be better. I think in the old days they used to always recommend the low, and then they came out with some studies that said, oh wait, maybe the young is actually better. So now we say there's no recommendation. You could do either one. Um, I think if you're very interested in index theory, you, my reading of the, of the literature says that the low index may be more appropriate when prices and quantities produced move in the same direction. So, you know, there's some set of goods and services that they just are more popular in the market. So that means the quantities are, are gonna go up, more people are gonna buy them. And at the same time, the prices will go up, right? Um, examples are, are things like technology services, right? Where they, they start out small um, and then, um, well, actually, let me take that back because some technology services happen when more is pr produced, the prices actually go down. Uh, technology often are, come out initially with very high prices, and then as it gets more in the market, the prices move down. So if your prices and quantities produced are moving in different directions, um, then you, a young might be more appropriate. Again, this is really only, this is advanced topics for those people that are very interested in index methodologies. Um, and if any of you fit that category, I, I'd be happy to answer questions about low and young indexes offline. But do, does anyone know, do you happen to do price updating of activity weights in BPS? Does anybody know? So I can show you how you do them, but if it's not something you normally do, it might not be the best use of our time. Um, 
Let me, let me show an example of what it looks like so that maybe it'll help you understand the concept. So activity weights are based on sales in a reference period. So the total 2010 sales of all telecommunications companies. 2010 sales are calculated as 2012 prices times 2010 quantities, right? That's the definition of revenue. Revenue is price times quantity, okay? So if we wanna price update the weights, what we're gonna to wanna to do is use 2010 quantities, because we're not updating the activity weights. We're gonna to try to take 2010 quantities with 2018 prices, okay? So let's say I introduce a new index in 2018. I'm still using 2010 weights, but I wanna price update them. My example here is we have, uh, in, in my example on the slide, the weights are from 2017. So if we want to price update the weights to 2019, we use 2017 quantities times January 2019 prices. Now, normally the way you price update the weights is you take the price index and you adjust the weight reference period weight by the change in that price index, okay? So let's say you already had a PPI for wireless telecommunications, and if you want 2019 price updated weights, you take your 2017 activity weights and adjust them by however much the price index increased between 2017 and 2019. The problem when you make new services PPIs is that the, CP, the PPI is new. So you don't have it, the historical information to price update the weights. What we often would do in the US is we would use a similar index. Whatever index we thought was likely to move with prices as similar as possible to what we think wireless telecommunications prices did. So let's say you already had a, a PPI for wired telecommunications. You know, we might say that's likely to move the most similar. So we would take our 2017 weight and adjust it based on the wired telecommunications PPI. Or we would say maybe the best we can do is to find a CPI. We know it doesn't move exactly the same, but it's the closest thing we can find to what we think the prices would have done in the PPI. So you take your 2017 weight and you update it to 2019 based on the changes in that CPI between those two periods. Okay, so that's, uh, again, if, if this is not something that's part of your normal work, you're not dealing with price updating activity weights, you probably don't need to worry about it. But um, this is something as if, if you're just working on data collection, you're not gonna worry about price updating weights. This is really for those staff that are involved in constructing the indexes, figuring out how to um, make the structure of index calculation work using the weight reference period weights and the calculated price indexes. And if you're involved in that work, this probably makes a little more sense. What it's really doing is you're, you're just using a different weight in the calculation if you use this method, not just the weight from your source. Like you're not just using the weight from the 2010 national accounts, you're gonna adjust them by a price index and then use them. Okay, but now the more important weights, I think if you're involved with data collection, item weights would be something you would be involved with. Um, so many countries take all of the companies that produce a particular good or service and they collect items. What I call items means an individual transaction, okay? So if I go to a, a, a wireless telecommunications firm, 
when I collect three voice plans and two data plans, I would say I have five items. Okay, each of those services I'm calling an item. They are a specified service that we select and collect from a producer. Most countries do not have weights for th those items. They will collect um, a certain amount of items from a certain amount of companies, and then they will use a, a geometric mean to average those prices together to get their index. Um, in my experience with services, I think it's it's not always possible to get item weights, but if you can, I think they are very helpful for improving the quality of the data. That is, is uh, an opinion I have maybe even more than some of my colleagues. Um, um, I think you could greatly improve the quality of an SPPPI by applying some weights to the items you collect. The ideal weight would be based on the sales of the company in the weight reference period or in a period after the weight reference period. <laughs> um, so if you're collecting a company in 2020, you're probably not going to want to ask for their 2010 sales. That's ancient history at this point. But if you ask for their, their sales from the most recently completed year, I think that's a good source for item weights. And we know that some companies will not provide us with the sales. And for those, we can impute weights. Okay, but like I said, many countries don't do that. They don't collect item weights based on company sales. They instead just apply implicit weights by throwing all the items into an index together and uh, taking geometric means. When we get to data collection, I'm going to talk more about uh, how we can make item weights. Okay, let me move on now to sampling. Um, I think you guys uh, do, do a great job of using these uh, lists from these government agencies as your sampling frames. The important thing you need for a sampling frame is some kind of size measure. Ideally, that would be total sales for these companies. Um, if you can get that, if you can't, you want something that's as similar as possible to sales, something that is highly correlated with sales. So maybe if you can't get sales for a telecommunications company, maybe the, the best size measure that correlates with that would be number of accounts. But the key thing is you need some size measure in your sampling frame. Frequently what I see used when, when you can't get something that has sales for each company is that uh, employment is, is the fallback. Um, and that's often if you're using uh, tax sources, if, they, if you can't get the sales, you take the employment. So I spend some time talking about sample units because again, this in my experience becomes very important with collecting services PPIs. There are three main types of sample units. The first type is called an enterprise. And I will use the definition from the uh, system of national accounts. An enterprise is the view of an institutional unit as a producer of goods and services. The term enterprise may refer to a corporation, 
a quasi-corporation, a nonprofit institution, or an unincorporated enterprise. And an institutional unit is an economic entity capable in its own right of owning assets, incurring liabilities, and engaging in economic activities and in transactions with other entities. And so that's a, a little confusing, but hopefully as we define these other units, we can put that in perspective. The next group is called enterprise groups. An enterprise group is a set of enterprises that is controlled by a group head. The group head is a parent legal unit, which is not controlled directly or indirectly by any other legal unit. So if you have a conglomerate, a big business that owns, that owns subsidiary businesses that operate in many different ISIC activities, the head of the conglomerate is the enterprise group level. Okay, so um, I have an example here that will show you what that might look like. But for now, the enterprise group is the highest level. The, the, in the hierarchy, it's the top of the hierarchy. And those are not appropriate as sample units. Okay, because really all they are doing at the very top is managing their subsidiary units. They're not really involved in direct production of goods or services. And their activities are, are very heterogeneous. Some of these conglomerates um, you know, will own businesses in many different ISIC, two digits even. Okay, then you have the establishment. And the SNA, the National Accounts, is based on a concept of establishments. An establishment is a part of an enterprise. Okay. Now, some businesses are small, and the establishment is the same as the enterprise. So, an establishment is a unit situated in a single location and in which only a single productive activity is carried out, or in which the principal productive ac activity accounts for most of the value added. So an, inter, uh, an establishment is really something like one retail store is an establishment, right? And maybe there's an enterprise that is a company that controls many retail stores, right? If you have a branded supermarket in, a, in your city, right, each location is an establishment and the operating unit that's controlling those establishments is the enterprise. Now, if the company that controls the supermarkets also owns a telecommunications company, then they would have an enterprise group that that uh, controls both the telecommunications and the supermarket activity. All right. Now a kind of activity in it. The more I had experience with SPPIs, the more I started using kind of activity units to collect data. A kind of activity unit is an enterprise or part of an enterprise that engages in only one kind of productive activity for which the principal productive activity accounts for most of the value add. So that part of the definition is the same as an establishment. The difference of a kind of activity unit and an establishment is that an establishment is always at a single location. A kind of activity unit does not need to be at a single location. Okay, so if you want to look at a company, let's say you have a company that does wired telecommunications and wireless telecommunications. Those are two separate four-digit ISICs. If you want to look at all the parts of that company that do wireless telecommunications and make that your sample unit, that's a kind of activity unit because you're not defining it based on a single location and you're also not defining it as the whole company. You're 
defining a portion of the business, not based on anything physical, not based on a certain set of locations, but based on a concept. I want to know about the parts of this business that offer this service. That's a kind of activity in it. Okay, so here's my example. I have a big holding company, a big conglomerate that has two separate enterprises, one that offers telecommunication services and another that offers, let's say like internet publishing and other kinds of services. So those are two different four digit ISICs. Um, and so they're, two, and they're totally separate enterprises. They have totally separate records, totally separate employees. Um, each of those enterprises, the telecommunications company and the internet company, may have uh, many different physical locations. They may have many different establishments. Now, for a telecommunications company, it's very difficult to collect data at the establishment level, right? Because their establishments are sales offices. Maybe they have a, 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 an office that has switching equipment. You know, we really don't. For pricing, we don't really care that much about the establishment level. If you run a survey where you're collecting employment, then you care a lot about each establishment level because you have to count employees that are in each geographic area. But for price indexes, for services, it's often very difficult to collect separate sets of prices for each physical location. It makes no sense at all, really, for telecommunications. So you're really, in most cases, not collecting that at the establishment level. You're either going to collect it at the enterprise level or at the kind of activity unit level. And again, because wireless telecommunications and wired telecommunications are separate ISIC activities, if you want to create separate units so you can have one unit in the wireless ISIC and one in the wired ISIC for the same company, then you're gonna collect kind of activity units. If you were to say, no, I don't do kind of activity units, I'm gonna just collect the enterprise, and you have a company that sells 50% wireless telecom and 50% wired telecom, you would have to figure out which of those services is 50.1% of revenue and assign the whole company to that activity. So you might have a company that basically sells half wireless and half wired, but you'd have to put the whole company in wireless telecommunications, let's say, and then you'd have a lot of what we call secondary production. Okay, that's hard. That's hard to do. Um, for those of you who have experience with data collection, it's, um, it's often difficult to, it also makes your indexes weird. You know, frankly, if you want to make a separate index for freight air transportation and passenger air transportation, and you classify your biggest airline, let's say they, they are 70% passenger and 30% freight. Now, when you have a freight trans, air transportation uh, PPI, it would not include your largest company. Because if you classified at the enterprise level, all of that activity would go to passenger air. Okay, It's only if you make kind of activity units that you can say, OK, for the big airline, I'll take 70% of their sales, and I'll make a sample unit for a passenger. And then I'll take 30% of their sales and make a sample unit for free. No, that's a bit tricky, but when we're really thinking about putting together all the pieces of coming up with a sample, coming up with weights for the different businesses and calculating indexes based on ISIC, these issues are important, you know, because they really make an, a, a big difference in what comes out in the final index. So I know we're running out of time here, so I want to uh, quickly run through some advantages of each of these types of sample units. Establishments, 
An advantage of using establishments is that it's typically consistent with industrial PPIs. So you have a clear boundaries between units, right? So if, if industrial PPIs are classified based on establishments and you decide, and but, but you have a company that does some manufacturing and some services, If you use an establishment, you can pick up every piece of that company in the different activities. But if you say, I'm going to collect the whole enterprise in the services activity, while the industrial PPI collects establishments, you might have overlap. So that's a challenge. So an advantage of an establishment is that you don't have overlap. Another important advantage, if you're just collecting for a small uh, particular location, that's not going to be as much response burden per unit, right? So think about um, a supermarket. If you're just going to each supermarket individually, you only need to collect a certain number of items, right? And you can represent everything they sell in the supermarket. But if you're trying to collect all the supermarkets in Jakarta for a chain, you're going to need to know about a lot more items right, because it's just representing a lot more economic activity. So more items, more response burden per unit. A disadvantage of establishments is you have a larger number of units to collect, which makes data collection more expensive. You have more units that uh, data collectors need to visit. A very important disadvantage here is many service companies are not able to report the activity and product sales needed for explicit weighting by location. Okay, so let's say we want to collect the revenue for the telecommunications company to make item weights. A telecommunications company cannot tell you how much revenue comes from a particular switching station or from a particular sales office. They're just not aligned that way. And I'm finding this more and more often with more and more service providers. You know, uh, even for professional services, you know, a lot of law firms, you know, now a lot of people are working from home. So how can they say where the sales for that lawyer, what physical location they get assigned to? It's, it's often not clear. So this is a particular challenge with services. For manufacturing, the establishment is a very logical place because you're dealing with a factory that produces a certain number of goods. But for services, establishments are much more difficult. Okay, and then the flip side of the establishment is the enterprise where you know, many of the disadvantages of the establishment become advantages for the enterprise. So when, if you go at the enterprise level, you have a smaller number of units to collect, which makes it cheaper. Um, and often I'm finding nowadays that, that businesses, when you go visit locations, they say, talk to my boss at headquarters, you know, so they'll, they'll direct the data collector back to the headquarters, even if you want to collect at the establishment level. Another disadvantage for enterprises is that if you're collecting at that level, you need to collect all the activities they produce. So that's secondary production. Okay, so if we go to collect an airline at the enterprise level, we have to collect passenger air and freight air at the same time, because the unit is the entire enterprise. And the kind of activity unit, the reason why I think it's an attractive option in many services activities is that it's a kind of middle ground. And it also gives you more control. You say, these are the activities that I want to collect. And a big advantage of kind of activity units is that you don't have to collect any secondary production. You're fielding a survey on freight transportation. All you need to collect is freight transportation. If the company happens to do some other activities, you exclude it, you don't have to worry about it. So that makes it easier to train your data collectors. You just tell them about whatever activity it is you want to cover. And I, um, I have some examples here, which maybe I'll, I'll start off with tomorrow. Um, 
we'll, we'll pick up this point about sample units. So we'll carry over a little bit into uh, tomorrow. But I do want to take some time if anybody has any questions. I know some of you, I'm sure, are going to want to go do your, uh, your normal jobs, which I'm sure you all have work to do as well. But I'm happy to stay on if there are any questions. Um, and tomorrow, I'll start back up again with sampling. Silakan Bapak Ibu yang ada pertanyaan bisa ditanyakan. I'm also going to try to answer some of the questions that were in the queue in the chat. There is a question in the call, chat column. This is Esther. Maybe I can uh, uh, read some of these questions and, and try to provide answers. Um, let's see. I saw a good question back here about, do we include the construction sector as a service or a product? Uh, that's a great question, because I think different areas handle it differently. Um, I would, it's generally included in services, um, but like I said, it's not consistent. I do have experience with making construction PPIs. It's, it's an, a difficult area because construction is generally composed of cost of labor and materials plus an overhead or, or like a profit that the construction company earns. So I think you can often take you could do something where you build a model price, which I'll talk about on Wednesday, I think, um, where you basically take a typical construction project, project and you set the inputs fixed. So if they used a certain amount of copper and a certain amount of iron or whatever materials they used, you set those fixed and then you can adjust the prices based on the industrial PPIs. Okay, so, and then for labor, also a big part of construction, I would take the labor, I would set it fixed from the initial contract, and then I would escalate the labor based on another index that was wages for construction workers, if, if you have it, and I think you probably would. So. Basically, I made it to the only thing I needed to collect from the construction company was their profit and overhead. And that was not easy <laughs> because they don't like talking about that. Um, and so we would try to do anything we could to get the companies to estimate it for us. 
And again, the biggest thing we would need for the overhead is knowing if it ever changed. But that's the, the part, you know, when uh, the economy is very bad, construction companies will have to give discounts and it's often coming out of that overhead. So um, it's important to track to capture the price dynamics. But if there's particular interest in that, I know you guys are planning at looking at that in three or four years. Um, but I do have some materials I'd be happy to share on that. Um, and and um, uh, give some examples of, of how we look at that. Because many countries, even that don't produce SPPIs, do try to make construction cost indexes and other things. So the construction cost index is easier than that construction output because the piece that you need to get is that profit slash overhead. Um, sometimes you could also talk to um, people within the construction industry, not firms directly, but any other source that might be able to give insight on what's happening with those overheads. But that's the hard part. Everything else you could basically track with existing indexes. It's just that overhead piece you need from the producers or from someone who knows it. Um, I'm trying to go back and get these in order. Uh, So uh, what occasions should you use PPI and what occasions we should use CPI? So, I mean, my general advice, I'm curious about some of the activities you're already collecting PPIs for, like education. I'm curious, you know, how different is the PPI for education from CPI education? I think that'll be something we can discuss on Wednesday. Um, um, You know, generally things like passenger transportation should be pretty similar, unless, you know, I guess a, a difference would be is if you have uh, domestic producers providing to uh, customers overseas, non-resident customers, that would be something that would be in a PPI, but not a CPI. I mean, an example of a service that's primarily provided to households, but that it, it's still good to do a PPI for is hotels, because in certain countries, hotels are, uh, a large proportion of sales are going to non-residents. So that's not captured in a CPI. So it would be the kind of thing covered in a PPI. But, you know, I'm curious about the education and uh, passenger transport and food and beverage, you know, generally these are the things that are pretty similar between a CPI and a PPI. Um, other questions? What weight would be recommended for developing countries like Indonesia? Well, look, you know, the weights are generally uh, the same everywhere. You know, you want to try to, for activity weights, you know, you're using the national accounts, which is, is great. I think the only improvement you can make is if you can see if there's some source that lets you update more frequently. Generally, we try to advise on every five years to update the weights. Um, you know, that's not always possible, but that's recommended practice. So if there is something like a, a you know, a general business survey or a, biz, a survey of service producers, that might be something you could use for weights. Um, but generally weights, weights, they're the same for developing, uh, advanced countries, it's all generally all the same. Um, the U European countries update their weights every year. Yeah, the US does not do that. So, you know, if you can do it, that's great, but so it could also be a lot of work. It, it's a lot of work to do it the first time. Then afterwards, if you have your systems automated, it's just taking, you know, particular weights and just uploading them, overriding them in the system. But weight updates can take a lot of time. 
How does the U.S. do data collection? Does the IT facility make it easier? You mentioned that the survey is still voluntary. Yes. Uh, the, the voluntary is what makes data collection hard because you got to convince businesses to give you data. Um, in the U.S., data collectors go to visit the companies in the PPI in what we call the initiation visit. So the first time they are selected to participate in the PPI, an individual data collector goes to visit them ideally in person and they select the products that we will collect. And then every month after that, the data collection happens online. But the, the first visit still happens in person with a data collector. But then once the products are selected in the future months, there's an online system where the business logs in and they could provide updated prices for those transactions. Still have some businesses who like to use phone and other things, but uh, by default, the, the option is online. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, I want, uh, that's my question. And also I want to ask whether the company or the, the enterprise or the establishments afraid of tax to give the information about the price. Is that uh, one uh, of the problem? <laughs> yes, so, so, you know, we can talk about strategies to get cooperation, but, but what, a big thing in the United States is we would tell the companies, we actually had a law that made it that we could not share their data with a non-statistical organization, including the tax authority. So that was uh, the situation in the United States was we had a law that said any data you provide has to be kept confidential. And if an employee of the statistical office exposed that data, they, would, they could be uh, charged with a, a criminal offense. So confidentiality protections are very important. Um, a lot of businesses, particularly in services sectors, I think are very um, reluctant to disclose their price information. They consider it a competitive trade secret. Um, so the more you can assure them about the confidentiality measures in place, the better chance you will have of getting that data. So that's one of the recommended practices is to explain to them all the restrictions that are in place against that data getting revealed to anyone outside of the statistical office. Another tactic we would use is we would get a letter from like a very senior government official, um, maybe like the head of the central bank or something and that we could give to businesses that say, look, the head of the central bank says it's very important that you participate with us. Or maybe you have a senior, any senior official, that, that kind of information is also helpful to get participation. But we never would collect the data if we weren't able to tell them it would be kept confidential. I hope that helps. <laughs> um, Or maybe Andrew, uh, I yes. will give a little uh, additional information. Uh, maybe in here, Indonesia, although we already have um, an initiation visit to the company before we uh, do a survey, uh, but uh, the company still didn't give us the data. It uh, although uh, also we have a low of statistic too but uh, i think it, it doesn't work <laughs> so maybe so it, it is yeah so maybe it is our big homework uh, how to build the engagement uh, with the company so they yes. can give us the data in my experience for the biggest most important companies we really thought of it as a negotiation, something that we could, we, we had to be flexible, right? We would say, we wanna normally collect this information, 
But if that's a problem for you, tell me what you can give me. <laughs> you know, we, we couldn't demand. And so for the largest companies, we would often, um, you know, at the end of my career in the, in the US uh, prices, I was the, in charge of all services prices. And if it was a very big, important company, I would go with the data collector. And the reason why I would go is because I can make those negotiations. <laughs> I could say, you know, I could see what they could give us and I would try to work with it the best I could. You know, um, I also, sometimes it's important even for, for very senior uh, people, if they can, they might be able to help to get part, uh, participation from the big important companies. Um, but again, in my experience, it's really, okay, is the data confidential? And is it gonna be easy for me to complete this survey? So sometimes we would have a, you know, a kind of complicated survey for everybody, but then for the big business, we'd say, tell me what you can do. <laughs> we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be as um, structured with them. We would be more open to learn about the reports they already have. One thing about big businesses is that they have very good systems internally for tracking their business activity. So they might have different kinds of data um, than small businesses. And so we might be able to use those good reports to get some kind of price. Again, we'll, we'll talk about unit value prices and other different types of prices later, um, but those strategies sometimes would work better with the bigger companies. And I can tell you there were very big companies in the US where we would say, this is the way we wanna collect prices for this activity. And we would do it for all the companies except the biggest one because we couldn't get that kind of price for them. So we had to get a, something that was not perfect. Um, try to answer this question. A PPI seen as a good pre-indicator of inflationary pressure, am I right? Yes, that's true. Um, and what's the relationship between PPI and CPIs? So some people think, you know, in some cases, a PPI could be a leading indicator of CPI. I think that's probably true of certain activities, but not all, because as we've talked about, it really represents a different basket of transactions. Um, I think I tend to see that more in the uh, industrial area, where you could think of it as more of a chain that happens over time, right? Uh, um, someone produces a good, and they start having to charge higher prices. And then the next month, the retailer will charge higher prices to the customer. Um, in a lot of services, there's, there's not as much middleman. So things get, um, price trends happen quicker between the producer and the consumer, but it really varies um, by activity. I would think for, for most of the services that we would work with, um, things like freight transportation, you know, that's not really affecting a CPI. It's outside of the CPI, it's outside of the household basket. So um, the relationship is complex. Some people say they could use PPI to, to, to um, forecast CPI, but in practice, I think that doesn't always work very well. Um, so they're important. There, there are different indicators with different purposes. In my experience, PPI is more used for deflating national accounts. You know, to get good GDP, national accountants want PPIs because it aligns with the production account concept. So um, that's something that's a special use of the PPI versus the CPI. And again, when I was trying to collect PPI data, you know, CPI, I think people understand, it's famous. You know, everyone knows about the CPI. No one knows about PPI in the public. No one, no one really cares that much about PPI. So we tell them, look, you might not know about PPI, but they need this to make GDP, okay? The central bank needs, they wanna know about PPI, okay? So it's more for these other economic indicators. And that's why we would take a letter from the head of the central bank because it was a way to convince businesses, you know, we're not famous like CPI, but look how important we are to national accounts and look how important we are for uh, people who make monetary and, and fiscal policy. Um, 
But and also it's it's almost easier when you produce price data, then businesses can use it. So you could tell businesses, you know, like, you know, some businesses would use PPI data for, uh, particularly for contract escalation. Um, and sometimes you could produce some materials that you can show to businesses, look, we're making these PPIs, this is how you could use these PPIs. A lot of the motivation comes from this will be useful for you. You give us the data, it helps us make this data, and then you get this data back and it'll help you with your business. Um, if we use KAU as a sample unit, do we have to obtain the sampling frame of all enterprise activities first? That's a great question. Um, that's a big challenge. So, The answer is yes, <laughs> um, but um, if, if you want to sample kind of activity units, you generally will get some sales for at the enterprise level, you know, particularly if the company is a company that trades on a stock market, like a, your big, big companies, they have to put out financial reports, right? So that tells you something about their revenue. So they might say in those reports how much of their activity comes from wired telecom versus wireless telecom. And we would have to use that information to create separate units for our sample. Now, again, it depends on what kind of sampling you do. Starting tomorrow morning, we'll talk a little more about sampling. And we'll talk about how if you use the cutoff method or the um, probability proportionate to size methods and different methods for selecting your producers. But generally, you could, if it's a big company that you want to make a kind of activity unit for, you could just say, look, we're going to take them with certainty. So you just, you could basically put whatever you, you want in your sampling frame because you already have done your work on your big companies and you know what you want to collect. So often it's the case that you have a sample of enterprises and then for your biggest businesses, you might go and create kind of activity units that you make so to be selected automatically. Again, this is really an approach. Think about you know, the big Indonesian airline, the biggest airline, right? You're gonna create kind of activity units for companies like that, not for smaller companies. I hope that helped a little bit, but uh, um, again, as you guys do your work uh, with, with these concepts, I'd be happy to follow up more through email to help you out. Oh, wow, this is a hard question. How to collect services data easily? If you could collect it easily, you wouldn't need me. I'm here because it can't be done easily. It can only be done difficult. That's why we have to spend a whole week in class learning. Sorry, I wish I had better answer for that one. Um, Yeah, it's interesting about health care. Um, you already, uh, remind me, I think you, you already publish uh, data for health care, right? Uh, yes. I thought, I thought so. Okay. Um, so I, because you already produce it, I didn't really put together a lot of materials about health care. Health care is also a very unique thing because uh, the market is very different in different countries. In most European countries, they have single payer, government pays for all healthcare. So there's no price really. So there's no price index in, in European countries. They, they, have, um, they have very limited price index for many healthcare services because there is no market price. Um, in the US, we do have market price, so we make a, a, an index. But it's but US, like I said, has a very unique system, not very logical. <laughs> so um, we design price index to match the system that's in place. I'd be interested to learn more about how the health system works in Indonesia, and then I could help you with the health care prices. Um, I think that's probably a, a bigger conversation, something that we would need more time for. 
But if that's something that's of interest to you, we could even we could schedule that next week or in the future. I'd be happy to have a session uh, where to learn about the healthcare situation in Indonesia and what you are doing for PPI and any questions you might have. But I think we would need more time for that, uh, that we won't have time for this week, but we can certainly do later. Yeah, maybe we can uh, discuss about it uh, at Wednesday, maybe, in a small group of discussion. I can, we could try. I, I think, again, we're going to, we'll probably have time constraints also on Wednesday. But yes, I, I'd be happy to answer questions on it on Wednesday. Again, I think, you know, we're doing training. And then I also want to do what we call technical assistance, which is more working with you guys as the prices team. Uh, on your very practical issues, you know, you you have to make these indexes. It's a lot of work. Um, so if we need more time, I'd be happy to also work with you after this week, because uh, ultimately I will make a report. But I think we might want to have more discussions before that report can be made. So I leave that to you, but I would be available for discussions uh, even after Wednesday. OK, Andrew, maybe uh, time is over. Yes, okay, time is uh, over. Yeah. Time for me to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. It's very late night there. So thank yes. you, Andrew, for the presentation. And thank you for uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen for participating in today's workshop. Uh, we hope that all participants will more understand about uh, what is SPPI, the purpose of SPPI, and about the waiting and something as well. I think it is enough for today. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, all the participants. We will have a break until 1 p.m. And we will uh, continue our agenda, agenda at 1 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. See you Thank tomorrow. You, Andrew. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Silakan Pak Cepi. Andrew-nya masih di sini. <laughs> ya, terima kasih Bapak Ibu semua atas perhatiannya untuk hari ini. Eh, mohon maaf waktunya terlambat 26 menit ya. Mudah-mudahan dapat menjadi ilmu yang bermanfaat untuk kita semua. Kasihan ini yang WIT terutama belum sarapan ya. Pak Muhtar itu belum sarapan kayaknya. Udah chef, udah chef. Udah jam setengah dua ya di sana ya. <laughs> Oke, mungkin Bapak Ibu untuk nanti siang, nanti Bapak Ibu bisa akses di Warkop aja linknya di yang internal session. Mohon jam 13 sebelumnya, 15 menit sebelumnya sudah bisa masuk ke uh, meetingnya. Agendanya nanti eh, Pak Nurul ya, Pak Nurul Hasanuddin yang akan menyampaikan materi. Oh iya Bapak Ibu, mungkin perlu satu hal lagi, evaluasi untuk hari ini, eh, khususnya untuk webinar ya, kita agak kerepotan untuk memasukkan Bapak Ibu dari attendees ke panelis. Ya, salah satunya dikarenakan Bapak Ibu sebelum mengklik link yang kami bagikan atau link yang di warkop belum belum login di zoom ya atau mungkin bapak ibu belum punya akun zoom bisa jadi seperti itu jadi eh, bisa dulu bapak ibu sign in eh, sign up dulu di akun zoom.as atau misalkan eh, kalau yang sudah di login dulu baru klik link yang di warkop sebetulnya yang di link di warkop dengan yang kami bagikan via WhatsApp, WhatsApp grup sama, cuma eh, seperti yang Mas Arbi sampaikan kemarin, jika Bapak Ibu mengklik yang di warkop, otomatis nanti centangnya akan tercentang sendiri sehingga bisa masuk ke step berikutnya. Linknya sama Bu Bapak, cuma itu poinnya satu itu aja sebelum klik link tersebut, baik yang di WhatsApp grup maupun yang di warkop, harap Bapak Ibu login dulu ke zoomnya. Ya, kalau ada kesulitan nanti ditanyakan di WAG aja. Mudah-mudahan Bapak Ibu besok kita 
kendala tersebut bisa diminimalisir karena ya kasihan juga saya oke mungkin terima kasih Happy berarti ini di lab ya? Uh, iya, uh, ini link untuk yang ini tidak dipakai lagi nanti pakai link yang ada di warkop Bapak Ibu ya. Yang Kita masuk ke warkop dulu terus ngambil link yang itu ya di warkop. Ya, tinggal klik link yang itu nanti join meeting. Oh, iya. Mas Capi, Mas, Mas aku tadi kan pagi kan gitu ya. Aku ke apa namanya ke masuk ke itu. Tapi aku nggak bisa masuk. Langsung sore ini. Gak bisa masuk di itunya di warkopnya. Saya berkali-kali masukin apa namanya ID, masukin password nggak bisa terus. Apa karena sebelumnya sudah pakai akun lain? Setengah dua sini. Pakai akun yang 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 apa yang BPS gimana? Sebetul, sebetulnya seharusnya e, ketika ibu tidak berada di meeting yang lain nggak masalah sih bu. Namun kalau misalkan nanti tidak bisa juga nggak apa-apa pakai link yang manual, masukkan ID sama passwordnya. Nanti untuk yang di warkopnya diklik aja biar terchecklist itu aja sih. Di warkop itu tujuannya biar terchecklist aja biar bisa next stepnya bisa eh. Pak Muhtar, kenapa buka baju itu Pak Muhtar? Pornografi itu. <laughs> Oke, mungkin itu saja, Ibu. Nanti kita pandu lagi di WAG ya, kasihan Bapak Ibu ini yang e, mau makan siang, khususnya yang WIT, Bu ya. Silakan, mungkin e, saya tutup karena Bu Eni mungkin ada e, ada sih cuma ya. Saya tutup aja untuk sesi ini. Terima kasih atas perhatiannya. Kalau masih ada yang mau ditanyakan via Zoom di sini silahkan, tapi saya tutup dulu bagi Bapak-Ibu yang mau lab dipersilahkan. Terima kasih atas perhatiannya, sampai ketemu nanti siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oke, terima kasih.